Okay, welcome all to the second episode of the Alt Act Chats podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Kyle Ireton. I, my other co-host, is the fabulous Akila Jairam. I am so pleased to welcome you today, Prachi. Uh, thank you for coming aboard. Thank um, you. <laughs> it is really our pleasure to have you. Sorry to cut you off there. Okay. I today feel like I really just want to dive into this because I'm so excited to hear from you and to get into our conversation. Uh, so our first guiding question that we like to ask is, would you mind introducing yourself um, and where you are at this very interesting phase of your career and, and life in general right now? Yeah, I'm happy to. So thank you. First, I just want to thank you both so much for um, inviting me to be on. I'm like happy to discuss all of these things. And um, yeah, we've had a sort of interesting trajectory um, myself, not one that I planned or expected. So I think that's something that's probably true of a lot of people that, um, you know, it's sort of in hindsight now I think about, um, you know, I have, a, I have a young son and I think about, um, you know, this idea of like, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up feels so preposterous to me now, <laughs> given that I kind of <laughs> reinvent myself every few years. Um, but uh, yeah, so I am, I'm Prachi Basti. I'm a, uh, currently I'm an associate professor of biochemistry and cell biology at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth College. Um, but I'm also the co-founder and the incoming chief scientific officer of a new research and development company called Arcadia Science um, that's in the Bay Area. And um, yeah, and I, I, I wear a lot of different hats. So I have uh, roles in a ver variety of different organism, organizations that are um, involved in open science. So I'm uh, the president of ASAP Bio, um, which is an, uh, a nonprofit that is involved in innovation and life sciences communication. I'm also on the board of directors of the Open Access Journal eLife. And um, yeah, so I, I, I do a variety of different things that are sort of passion projects of mine. And I think, you know, in general, in my sort of academic life and outside of it, I have, you know, pretty much focus on the, the types of things that I think are important for science and society and, and that I think really sort of speak to, uh, you know, generating sort of the world in science that, that we hope to live in. So um, that's, that, yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thank you so much for explaining that. Um, I'm really impressed by the just like spectrum of all the roles that you have inhabited and do inhabit. Uh, it's just, it's, it's inspiring to see. <laughs> um, Akila, would you like to uh, kick off the next round? Yes. Yes, Prachi. So I think for the next question, we'll go a bit uh, back in time. So how did you get your start in academia and how did you end up you know, founding a company whilst being in a, uh, a professor? Like how, how did that happen? How the process was? We would love to hear more about that. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think my the beginning of my academic life was very similar to most people's, like the very um, sort of expected trajectory. Although I don't know anymore. Like, I don't know that there is a, a normal, like I think everyone does a variety of different things and everyone's path is circuitous and all of that is great and fine and better, I think. Um, and so I, I, I did get involved in undergraduate research early on. Um, I did that throughout undergraduate and really should highlighted my passion for science, no matter what area of science it really was. And, and that led to getting a, a PhD in neuroscience. Um, and so that's, so I went straight from undergrad to a PhD. Um, and, you know, that, you know, I had sort of variety of different, um, you know, things happen during my PhD where I was involved in, 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 neuroscience research, but then sort of late on in my PhD, I switched labs, still in neuroscience, but in, in, in a different area of science that um, sort of started over almost like at the end, <laughs> like right, right when people are thinking about defending, I sort of started over in a different area. Um, but it was sort of in neuroscience and in, a, in more involved in cell biology, where I is the you know, my current scientific passion and something that I, it really has led to the, the future work that I continue to do in my, in my own lab. So, um, so as a, as a PhD student, I, I moved to this other lab, I was doing uh, work in cell biology and photoreceptors, which are neurons, so still in the neuroscience program, but towards the end of my PhD, I did an internship at Genentech. Um, in South San Francisco, which was like a really illuminating experience. So I, I actually wasn't really thinking or interested in, in biotech at that time. But I, you know, what I often say is that it just seemed like a really fun thing to do. My sister lived in San Francisco. Um, it was, um, you know, an attractive opportunity. I just, you know, I think the way that that happened was I saw some ad like posted in like departmental like message, you know, whatever, you know, people, I, 
<laughs> how often this happens anymore, but just, <laughs> you know, some sort of, uh, you know, flyer or something. Um, and I, um, you know, did this internship for that summer. It was 10 weeks. Um, but I often say that I learned, I got, I did about 10 months of worth of work in 10 weeks. And it really changed my thinking about how science should operate and be done. Um, and just how we even think about allocating resources. And these are things that all like really came up and became helpful for um, how I thought about resources and, um, you know, in my own academic lab. So, but, you know, that was a really fun experience. I learned a ton from it and, and I still sort of went on to do this, what was traditionally, you know, an academic path by going on to do a postdoc, but I did come back, you know, that, that experience, you know, spending the summer in San Francisco, I ended up coming back to the Bay area to do my postdoc. Um, and then went straight from that to, uh, my first faculty job. So, um, uh, I started my, my, faculty career as um, assistant professor in anatomy and cell biology at, in uh, Kansas City. So at the University of Kansas Medical Center, I spent, um, I guess, a total of five years there. I got tenure there. And then I actually, um, shortly thereafter, I moved my lab to, um, to Dartmouth, which is where it is today, um, and uh, into the Department of Biochemistry and Cell Biology. So I, so I moved my, my, my lab, and a number of my lab members came with me. Um, and that's where the lab has been since the summer of 2020. So that was still like during the pandemic and not that long ago, it's been only about two years. Um, and, um, and really, you know, shortly after I got there, this opportunity came up. So I had, um, very, very serendipitously, <laughs> um, you know, so the, the plan, obviously I had just moved my lab. I was like ramping up like now, of course, like the pandemic is a strange situation for everyone. And none of us had any plans that actually ended up being what we thought they were during that time. And so, um, you know, things were, you know, I, you know, I just moved my lab. The plan was to just, you know, ramp up my research program there. And, you know, everything was like all systems go extremely happy with, um, you know, the department and the, I, I just, it's a really, really outstanding place to do science. And I, um, you know, among, uh, you know, people in the department who are, you know, very much like, um, you know, working in areas of science that I find like truly exciting and interesting. Um, and so everything was like all systems go there. And, you know, but as, as I mentioned before, I do a lot of other things <laughs> in science, you know, and thinking about how we might, you know, shape the, not just what science we do, but how we do it um, through, you know, a variety of different organizations that I think are, are making a difference and, and trying to move the needle sort of myself. And I had, you know, as, as, as a junior faculty member, I got really interested and excited about preprints and how we share science. And it really transformed my thinking about like, just what we should do. I was so excited about the idea that that authors could share their science when they see fit. And like that just was the only thing that made sense to me. Um, and so, um, yeah, so I was like, you know, working in a variety of these organizations, thinking about and, and, and trying to operate in science the way that I thought I should and that we should. And, um, and this opportunity came up to sort of start discussing like what would, you know, if we really could reimagine what science looks like, what could we do, right? And so, um, you know, I started talking with my co-founder, um, Asime Chow, and I had not, I did not meet her before. Like, sometimes I feel like I need to like say that because it's, you know, people just assume like, oh, you know people your whole life and then you go and buddy up with your friends. And it's just like, no, I did literally did not know her, you know? Um, and uh, we met um, only about, it's shocking, like only a little more than a year ago, <laughs> you know? Um, and um, yeah, last spring in the, or the spring of 2021. Um, and, you know, she was, had been thinking about like how we might reshape science and really, thought that any sort of effort like that should have some sort of open science component. And she and I had a mutual friend who um, was involved in the open science space and who introduced us. And, um, you know, sort of, you know, he, uh, as I mentioned, I'm the president of ASAP Bio and our, our friend, um, uh, Jamie Frazier is uh, the vice president of that organization. That's how we know each other. But she and, she and he go way back in, to grad school. Um, they went to grad school together. And so she was sort of talking to him about this and he's just like, oh no, you don't want me, but I know who you do want. And so we put us in touch and we started just talking, but, but she and I are of the type that like, when you start making up, like start talking about exciting things, like how we might reshape to science, like we just started like working and writing and thinking of plans and coming up with what it would look like, what's, how it would be structured, coming up with a proposal for like how, you know, how we would think about doing this. And, you know, long story short, it turned into um, Arcadia Science. So we um, uh, technically uh, were uh, 
uh, founded a year ago. Um, we incorporated, we started this, this, this company and, and, and the main goal is to try and rethink how we do science. So how, what science we do, how we fund it and how we communicate it. And those are sort of the pillars that I describe as being the, the key functions of that. And that means that, you know, for, for what science we do is probably what you've seen on our website. We are, um, you know, expanding the range of biology that we look at, letting evolution solve biological problems, um, looking at non-model systems to discover new um, and novel um, ways in which life has, has really done the experiments for us, right? And so that's the scientific focus, but we are a for-profit company, even though we have a very like deep mission to do a lot of things in, in, with respect to science. And that is because we want to grow the pie. You know, we want to change um, you know, we want to be able to attract more investors to basic science and think about how do we more efficiently, you know, you know, funnel resources in that way. And so, you know, in order to do that, we want to demonstrate that there is an immense value in this, right? And we can really only do that if we show that we can make money doing it. <laughs> and so what we want to do is to make that case and to say, hey, sometimes it feels serendipitous to like do basic science and result in like and find something that's going to be useful. But, you know, these examples are everywhere. CRISPR, GFP, PCR, these things where like a range of biology like had interesting innovations, right? You know, and it feels serendipitous, but we want to ask the question, what if it, what if we tried to do this, um, you know, in a concerted way is, are there ways where we can make it more likely to, and, and less serendipitous to, to uncover new innovations, right? And so through a range of biology, like looking at things that are unique from humans, not that are exactly like humans, right? And, or, or similar enough. And so what we, um, you know, we want to make that case and also we want to, we think there's a lot of good reasons people don't do the science in this way. And we think we can solve a lot of those problems and, and help many more people try to do, you know, rather than, you know, having a hammer and looking for nails, you know, by like using the same organism or the same approach and then try to find ways in which it might be useful to say like, look, you have a science, you biological question, scientific question. What is the best way to answer that? What are the right organisms to answer that in? What are the right comparisons to make? Like, what is the right way to do it? And how can we enable you to do that? Right. So, it, so for us, like the mission is so much, not what can this building do, but what, what can we do here that will change what science, what science can get done and what all scientists can do. Right. And so that is like a real core mission for us. And then of course, the last piece is how we communicate science. I'm like a deep believer in open science. I think it's better science. I think there's, um, it's faster, it's more rigorous. Um, it is um, the only way that I think makes sense to, in order to do the best science we can. It's an acknowledgement that all the good ideas don't live in one place. They live wherever they live um, and all the expertise lives wherever it lives. And if we really wanna do the best science possible, the only thing that makes sense to do is to, to, to share what we're doing and like help work with the rest of the world in trying to, to make that as good as it can be. Um, and so, yeah, so we think all of these different experiments are really must be run in sort of parallel to try and maximize any one of them. So I, so, you know, it, it's probably as you see with other people, it's hard to, you know, there is no roadmap, right? Like it's hard to say like, oh, here's the path in which you get, you know, we were so taught to say like, here, what are the rules? And, and, and I don't know, I think like every single thing in my life that has ever been worth doing, like didn't adhere to any rule, right? Like it just, I think, um, you know, all of our experiences are unique. We are all unique people. Like, I think there are as many ways to do science <laughs> um, as there are scientists. Like there, there is just, a universe of possibility. And I am not convinced that we have like found the best ways. I think that the only thing to do is to try and to, and the only thing to do is to listen to a lot of people and put that through the filter of your own experience and decide, you know, like what is it that fits you that will maximize your strengths and your skills and really unleash you to do what is like the, the best and most appropriate thing. And that, you know, that, that you feel like you should be putting your efforts towards. So, um, you know, sometimes I tell the story of it and it just seems like the whole thing is preposterous because it sounds like completely far-fetched and out, because it is, you know, like I could not have made any of this up. I did not plan for this, right? Um, but I will say that the one thing I did do at every concerted step was to, um, you know, to, to really be open-minded to opportunity. And I feel like I, I say this to everyone all the time that, you know, I have been taught my whole life and my whole career to say no to everything and to protect my time and to protect what was good for me. And I, and I have always hated that advice. Um, and I've always felt like, 
you know, yes, it's, it's not lost on me that yes, there's a finite amount of time, you know, in the day and that doing something is less time doing something else. And we do have to prioritize. And I do relentlessly prioritize actually, but it's based on what I think is important, right? Like, and, and so, and what I think I want to spend my life and my time doing. And so I think that these are, you know, and, and, and I do have a very long view. I don't, sometimes there are things that I don't know what the immediate benefit is. And often the benefit is not to me, you know, but it will, you know, this thought of like, what could be possible? And I don't know what the answers of all of those are down the line, but sometimes it's just important for me to think about trying to do those things. And so even though there's no roadmap, I think the one, the one principle I have thought has been the most, um, you know, consistent throughout my life and my career has been to be open-minded to those opportunities because you just never know who you might meet or what you might do or, or, or what ideas you might stumble upon that could be the thing that, you know, puts you in the position to have the life and the career and the impact that you want to have. Sorry, that was like one question and I talked for a very long time. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I think you answered a lot of our questions, Prashi, and thank you so much for those insights. And it's really a, a very unique initiative that you're uh, heading because you, I think as an experimentalist, I do understand, you know, the, the point you made about hitting uh, many nails with a hammer and trying to just, you know, find a needle in a haystack almost. So if we have a better way of doing science, then I'm sure that's welcome by the community and also by industrial funders. I just had one follow up question from what what you were saying. So you okay. mentioned that your your experience, your internship uh, led you to think about, you know, how to uh, do better resource alloc allocation and so on. So could you just touch upon yes. that? A yes, for our, I'm happy to talk uh, about that. Listeners who might be, you know, trying to uh, get some experience themselves. So just yes. so they get a contrast of how industry works uh, versus academia. Oh my God. I mean, it was such an eye-opening experience. I'm happy to talk about that. This is, so one thing that was a really big shock to me. So one of the ways in which they sort of do resource allocation there is, and I still think about everything this way, right? It's like they they tried to, you know, if, if you have ever sort of like been in, like a position to allocate resources for science, you know, most people will find that the biggest cost is personnel. People is the biggest cost always. Okay. No matter what sector you're in or whatever, people is the biggest cost. Yes. They're like really expensive science and things like that, that can be very costly. But the truth is for most things, people are the biggest scientific cost. Right. Um, and so this is something that is not lost on biotech, right? And so something that happens is a little bit more of thinking about, you know, having people do what they are uniquely able to do and to say, look, you know, I'll give you an example. Like there's certain things that, you know, you could say, you know, in the context of students or something, you could say, okay, you could spend your time doing this and it might take you eight months or whatever, or you could outsource it, you know, uh, and, 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 or order it or something. And that might look like it costs a lot of money, but what does that money cost relative to people time, right? Like whether it's, if you, if you order something or, or have some, or outsource that, that work and you can get it done in a month versus it takes you 10 months to do it yourself because you're just learning how to do it. And it's just, it, you know, and, um, it could take 10 months. Well, what is like 10 months of salary, you know, along with all of the, resources in all of those attempts to do that relative to the cost, even though the cost, the ticket price might seem high, right? But like, what is the actual time cost and people cost and all of those things? Now, that said, in academia, there are other missions, right? Like there are missions to um, uh, um, educate you know, to, to actually make sure that people are learning how to do science. Now, of course, that's the case. And it could be very well worth putting in the time to learn how to do those things. So that is like another balancing factor, right? So it's not like it's so obvious that you should just pay for things because it's easier and faster and you still haven't learned anything. That's also the case. But I will urge you to think about the clip at which science moves. I don't know how many things I learned as a PhD student that are like so totally out of date and never will be used again, ever again, you know, because like, you know, things, how much time did I spend trying to do, like become an expert on a thing that is like, a, that you now, like literally the entire universe of science, like, you know, orders that from a website now, you know, like, and it's just, 
it's one of those things like, is it, you know, it's worth thinking about, is it worth like learning this thing? Is it worth, you know, or this skill or whatever? It could be that it's worth learning the process of like doing science and all of these things, right? But then it could be that, okay, now you've learned it. Do you need to now do it again over and over and over and over and over and over again? Or is it worth now the next time buying the thing <laughs> or outsourcing the, the, the project or whatever, right? So, but it's, these are things where, like I said, because I got those like 10 months worth of work done in 10 weeks by you know, there was just the advancement in the science was so much greater, right? And I, I learned, I still learned so many things about science, right? So that is a balance, but I definitely, you know, when I started my academic lab, I absolutely, you know, changed the way I put money towards resources and people as a result of that experience. So it's just, it's just realizing, you know, what is the cost and why? Like, is it the right answer to always say, we need to take the hardest path, we need to learn every single thing, or that this is something that is exactly that, even if you learn how to do this in no point in your life ever, will you not, you know, cloning, for example, like you may want to, like, of course we want to learn how to clone things. The mechanisms for like the ways in which people clone things have changed so much, even in my time in science, but now even like, you know, gene synthesis is becoming so much cheaper, you know, and it's sort of like in the future, like we will generally be synthesizing all of these things. Like how important is it that you learn how to do X, you know? Um, and yes, there could be like, there are things that I learned about science through learning how to do a lot of things the hard way that are totally obsolete, but <laughs> you know, but it's, it is just a balance and it's worth like rethinking our priorities and just not having the automatic reaction to like sticker shock, you know, <laughs> um, from like what it costs to do things because there is a hidden cost to other things. Right. <laughs> and so I think one of the things that I learned was thinking more about those hidden costs. Thank you so much, Prashi. I think that that has been very insightful to both uh, Kyle and myself, as well as our listeners. Um, so over to you, Kyle, for the next couple of questions. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say everything you were describing reminded me of your earlier point about prioritizing things, right? Questioning the way we allocate our resources in terms of not just money, but time, energy, focus. Totally. Yeah. Um, I really, <laughs> I'm also, you know, I, I laughed at a couple of points and there are so many awesome threads that you brought up here. Um, that was just pure brilliance from you. And uh, I'm just so excited we get to talk about this. I, I think I am going to just try to be responsive to this conversation instead of worrying about, you know, right. the, like, structure. Um, yeah, I, I relate a lot to what you were describing about feeling like you're background was already outdated by the time you finished your PhD. And you know, frankly, you know, it, it looks like to me, you did not graduate like all that long ago. Like <laughs> you've had like a very fast, like acceleration of your career after your PhD. And it's just mind boggling to think like it, we, we lionize the PhD experience, like the, the grad school training as this elite concept, but you're pointing out the ways in which I feel that it falls short in the real world in some respects. Um, yeah, I will say that I do. I do think graduate education is so interesting and important because uh, here's the thing that I, you know, so there is this thing like, oh, should people go and get a PhD? And I actually think that I, I am like a huge fan of this, and but not for the reasons that people think, right? Like, it's not because we need to do like this protracted like mechanism of like learning things, right? Like, but I do think that it does, one thing that it does, not so much about learning those skills, it's about like learning how to like think and be rigorous in your thinking and find the boundaries of knowledge and push past it, right? So this is why one of the reasons why I really, really don't like the narrative that like, oh, well, I was never trained to do X, Y, Z in my PhD. And now I'm, you know, we're totally unequipped to do whatever job and we need to gear all of these different, you know, things in your PhD towards all of these different career paths and whatever. And I just nonsense. Like, I actually don't believe in any of that. I actually think that the thing that you're actually learning to do in your PhD is learning all of those things, like learning how to think and how to be rigorous in your thinking, how to find the boundaries of knowledge, how to push past it. And, and that means that you can learn anything. <laughs> you learn what you know, what you don't know, how to find out what you don't know, right? And so it's like, that is the true unique superpower that you're gaining. And now you can do anything, <laughs> you know? And I really believe that. And so I think that this idea, like, yes, I think that there is probably too many, like too many people like being funneled into an academic system when a lot of them are not going to take that path. And yet I don't think that, you know, where does it fork, right? I think it can fork anywhere and, and everyone can't feel empowered to do, you know, whatever jobs they want to do at whatever point they want to do them. 
But I do think that this, this is where I think that the, there is value in trying to figure out what, what it is that like tr truly finding out how to determine what is, what is known out there. And this actually comes up even in, in business, right? Even if you're if, well, like, how do you know whether you have a good idea for a business? or whatever it's just like well what is known <laughs> what what science is out there what what have people done already like you guys will be familiar with that because it sounds a whole lot like doing science right <laughs> like it's yeah. just, but these are skills that you like these are the transferable skills right and so i think that mm -hmm. that is something that is really extraordinarily useful and um yeah and then the, everything else is just you know now it is applying those really important skills, not necessarily the hard skills of the specific science that you learn, which are of course important. And if we, and of course we get deeper and deeper into that expertise. And there are things about my specific science I'm more an expert on than like anybody else, but that is not, you know, I don't feel like that is the true strength of the, the transferable skills, right? Like that, I feel like we have the power to like do, a, a, you know, a lot of things in our careers. And that's because we have this, like, like the ultimate transferable skill is learning how to learn. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and one of the things that I feel really passionately about, you know, one of the primary motivations for me to try to do this Altac Chats thing is, you know, I'm looking at my friends who are still in grad school. Um, I myself, I graduated recently, like a year and a half ago, basically. Uh, and I finished up in like the midst of the pandemic. So that was uh, just a ridiculous, weird time. I can only imagine how crazy it was to try to start a lab in that environment. Oh, man. Uh, as well yeah <laughs> um but i just wanted to to chime in and echo what you were saying i see my senior grad student friends as like absolute master problem solvers they're so competent and so skilled Seriously. and one thing that like really drives me crazy with like this uh you know the postdoc crisis that people talk about in twitter is like the problem i see at my you know, not to like name names basically, but like in my local environment, people are being kept in grad school for such a long time mm -hmm. to finish up these protracted projects, which are so specialized, but these are master master problem solvers that could be doing anything. Like they have all the skills they need to bring that to a new field. Yeah. So like, why why are we like protracting the, the struggle basically? Like yeah. what, who does that serve? Yeah, no, and I think I hope I hope like all like graduate students like sort of feel empowered that it is like really up to them. I think that there is this like sort of general feeling like they and it's not that there aren't cases where people are being held back so that they can finish sign like once they become really efficient people want to hold on to them and of course that's the case. But that said, like it is absolutely you know this is why there are committees and things like that like it really is, you know, in the hands of those senior students to say like look I'm ready to go I have something else some other job to do and I'm going to go do it, you know, and I think that those things are, you know, like there is some shift that happens and sort of like you know later in one's graduate career when you realize it's actually in your hands it's not that somebody else is going to tell you when it's done like it's up to you you know and so right. like deciding when to like lift that thing up make the big push to the end finish it go on it like find something else to do and and go and do that like those are things that are like largely in, in the hands of the students and so like I think that that um you know, I think that, you know, of course, there's like all these other problems about, like I mentioned, like people really want to hold on to efficient scientists and they want to, and then there's sort of people are trying to get their publications out, which is another reason I think preprints are amazing and you should just get your work out anyway. Um, and, and that really can like really the part of the benefit of that is like making sure that your work sees the light of day um, much, much earlier. And you can get that broader feedback and it can make the whole process go faster. And um, yeah, so I think that there's just, you know, we're in a really amazing, awesome time in science, I think, where we are, the, you know, the, the landscape is shifting both for what opportunities there are and the ways in which we share our science and all of those things. And it's just like truly, truly exciting to me. And so I'm just happy for like all of you. Like, it's just a great time to start. In, like, yes, it, I'm sorry, the pandemic is awful, but like it is also, but as in this moment in time and like what is shifted and the, the things that has, you know, that have transformed inspired have opened people's minds to different possibilities and and to challenge their own assumptions about what those paths need to be and what how they value those things is just a really really positive thing in my mind absolutely i totally agree with you um and you know i want to acknowledge that there are probably there are many factors that impact why people stay in a phd there are aspects that we choose there are aspects that we don't choose um speaking just to my own experience it's funny, you know, the way I think about it is like, I, I basically changed my mindset and just made a decision one day, like, I'm ready to finish my PhD. I'm going to yeah. tell my advisor, like, I'm graduating. Yeah. 
you know, I feel like I was probably lucky to be in a position where I had an advisor that would like listen to me, take it seriously and where I could navigate that. But like, yeah. I, I think you're right. I don't know if all PhD students realize like you, you do have power. You do yeah. have power, not absolute power in all cases, but okay. you can spark that. Yeah. Oh man. If there's like one thing I hope your audience and everyone gets, it, it's that it's that there is, you know, this is not to say that everyone is of equal power everywhere in the system. Of course, that is not the case. Of course, there's bias. Of course, there's like career hierarchy and all of these things. And yet, I think that we take one small fraction and use the agency that we actually do have, right? And I just think that, you know, I, I see why people don't see that and don't do use it. But I, I think that there is so much more we can do than we choose to do. And that if when we, do, when we exercise that agency, we realize like, everything that that opens up, right? The, people do, don't do this out of fear and out of, you know, they're, you know, obviously I've heard every example you have about, about, you know, all of the concerns people have about that. But the truth is, is that so many of these things, when you take those liberties and you decide like, this is how I want to operate in science. This is how I want to set my own trajectory. And these are the decisions that I want to make. And when you start to do that and you find every new opportunity, everything that that on Locks, right? And that many cases, like, yes, you know, people worry about them, that they would be punished for such a thing, and don't ever think about the ways in which they are rewarded for such a thing, right? Um, and so I think that that is something that you only know once you try to do it, right? <laughs> it's like, you can listen to other people, and you can say, yeah, well, that's easy for you, because of XYZ, you can, you, like, th there is no experience that will, like, bring that home for you, besides your own, like, venturing into that space to find out, like, what is possible if you decide to do, you know, um, you know, to do science and to, to work, operate in your career the way that you feel you should. Truly, yeah. Um, one thing you were making me think about is the fact that regardless of how much power we feel that we have in a situation, I do think a lot of grad students, a lot of academics have much more power than they realize in the sense that they have this immense value. And it's funny when you take a step outside of the system, talk to someone in industry, they can acknowledge that, they can bring that to light. And I, I just wanna shine a light on that for everybody, you know, so people can start to try acknowledging it that for their own sake, you know, to move yeah. forward with their lives, however they see fit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, completely agree. <laughs> um, Acula, so I just, you know, kind of was riffing there off of this uh, conversation. Do you wanna take the next turn here? Yes, sure. So Prashi, when you were talking to us about transferable skills and so on, a question came to mind. Uh, so a lot of our audience members ask about more softer skills, the, the you know, communicating with investors, also, you know, thinking of, of, of a business plan, for example. So how did you go about that uh, with your startup? How did you manage to get those skills? Did you attend any courses or, or was it more, um, you know, you just learned on, on the way? How, how did you approach that? That would be quite useful to know. Yeah, so I will say the communication skills are, you know, um, are, are really good <laughs> to have for any job. <laughs> um, and I know that that's not equally easy for everyone, right? So I fully acknowledge there is also people who feel less comfortable, more are more introverted, um, don't sort of communicate in the same way. They don't um, have the same um, sort of um, pace of communication as, and as others might have. And like, these are all things that I think are really important and interesting skills. And I would say that like the most important thing for this, in my opinion, is practice, right? And so I think one thing that, you know, you can, you can take courses and whatever. I'm not sort of a huge fan of doing a, I, first of all, I'm generally not a huge fan of like, sort of like didactic training for things that you can't use in practice all the time, you know? So like, exactly, like there are a lot of things are like, oh, I've never had training in management and whatever thing and whatever thing and whatever other skill. And it's sort of like, yes, but if you're not using that on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, there's no way for you to like gauge um, to, to truly learn from it and adapt your own practices as a result of that learning, right? It can just be like this thing that you now know, and that's good to know, but like, <laughs> you know, uh, I have so many examples of exactly that, but, but I think especially for communication, you know, two things that come to mind are a getting outside your comfort zone because it's uncomfortable for everyone right like I think some people think like oh yeah this is just must, must come so easy for you because you talk all the time when you talk so much I'm like <laughs> so it's and, and I would obviously would like to acknowledge that it's not as e equally easy for everyone but it is also 
extremely difficult and requires practice and is hard it, also a process for every person right like what you see is always a snapshot of where someone is today based on where you know their whole life trajectory of getting to that point right and so it doesn't really make sense to like evaluate you know two people who have not had like equal amount of time and effort and energy and opportunities to do the same thing and then say that it's easier or harder for the person like who knows like the, the point is is that all of us are on some trajectory trying to get better at everything we do right <laughs> and so um and so that is I hope people feel that you know that that the more you know no, no matter how easy or hard it is for you to do a thing the more practice you have at it the, the better you will get at it or at least the more you will learn about what you what, where the gaps in your knowledge are or what you might want to improve um and so i think those things are really really useful is to make sure that you you, you know you fight for the opportunities to get practice doing the things you want to get better at you know, and so it, you know, sometimes it can feel like, oh, I'm just like, you know, I just also encourage you to be proactive about that and to not just like wait for some people talk about like, oh, well, they, this person has had the opportunity for X or has had the opportunity for Y. Well, it, it, it requires like more opportunities requires being proactive, being saying yes to things that will result in other people asking you to do more things. <laughs> like, you know, the, these things are all, you know, they are compounded upon one another. And so, and it requires a huge amount of effort to get involved and to do things, right. And to say, to sign up for things that that will give you those opportunities that you are uncomfortable doing, you know? And it's like, it is, yeah, it's like, it, you know, it, it's just one of those things that if we can get more practice, um, you know, I think people, even, even if you, you know, you will get better at it, but you will also be less anxious about it. And it will become, you know, I think we all like resonate with this with like public speaking or whatever, you know, like giving your first talk is like extremely terrifying, <laughs> you know? And um, and then and then as you go further along and you do it more and more and more, it becomes less terrifying and it becomes a little easier and it becomes more second nature and you sort of seen more of like the universe of what could happen. So you feel less like, concerned about unexpected things happening. And, you know, I think all of these things come with just like um, practice, but then also generating proactively the opportunities to get that practice. I think that's some very, very interesting and insightful advice there, Prashi. Thanks so much. So just following on that, if if there was a piece of advice you could give your younger self in grad school, what would, what would that be? Oh, man. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that... Um, the piece of advice I would give is, is, you know, I think the thing I've already told you that I, that I think I realized is how much is in our control. And, um, you know, that's something I learned sort of the hard way is that I sort of, you know, it can feel very much like you're at the mercy of your advisor and your graduate program and your institution and your, and the larger academic community. And we worry about so many of these things. And I'm not saying it's not for good reason and that people are not in a range of situations. But again, I think the, the thing that, um, like I said, that has really um, served me well is to think about, you know, broadening, you know, making sure that you re we all realize that we have agency and the opportunity to, to set that trajectory, but also recognizing that, you know, where are we going for advice, right? Like, who are we actually talking to? And to me, like I mentioned before, it is so important that you cast an extremely wide net. This is why I love social media. This is why I love Twitter, right? It's a universe of people. And you have access to a lot more ideas, thoughts, people. This is like unbelievably powerful in my mind, right? And so, but then you like just completely unlock the doors to all of this information. And you can see, like, I feel like my, like the most influential advisors to me have been like totally random strangers on the internet that I didn't know personally. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, people who inspired me to think differently that resonated with my like values and, you know, goals. And, and so I didn't have to say like, oh, I'm just going to ask this, you know, putting all my eggs in one advisor basket. I had, you know, that to me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That's sort of how the things are structured. And we sort of think like, this is, this person is our, like, whatever, our mentor, our, and we're walking in their footsteps, whatever thing, you know, where you know, all of those sort of mentorship eggs are in that one basket and that we are at the mercy and at, at you know, at the, you know, stand to benefit from that one person. And I just think that's the thing we should really make sure people understand that the universe is your teacher. Like, they, you know, you can choose like to who you listen to and how, like where you get that information and, and and take all of that. And again, weigh it with the filter of your own experience and your own circumstances, right? And then use that to make you as, you know, uh, you know, as prepared and as strong as you 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 want to be, right? To to do what you want to do, right? And so I think that is 
Um, I think I probably, if I had to give myself advice in the past, it would have been to, to cast a wider net sooner um, and to not feel I was at the mercy of like a very specific set of people and advice and, you know, circumstances. I think that's some very powerful words as well. And I can relate to that because I have, I didn't use Twitter as much, but more LinkedIn. And I found that a lot of people were so happy to, you know, speak to me, although they were complete strangers, they've helped me more in my career journey than a lot of people in my immediate environment, also because they didn't have those experiences. So yeah. I think that that's definitely very good advice and something that I've done as well. So thank you Great. so much, Pashi. So I'll hand over back to Kyle for the last uh, few questions. Uh, so over to you, Kyle. Thank you. Yeah, um, everything that you said resonated with me so much. I mean, like to state the obvious connection here, uh, I crossed paths with you on Twitter, yeah. right? Like we just, uh, I, I think I followed you. You know, I remember when people announced like Arcadia Science was was being formed and founded, there was a huge splash on Twitter. Uh, and I kind of found it by mutual connections of like, you know, people that I had started following since I started branching out more at the start of my postdoc. Um, like you were saying, I just wish that I had started sooner. Um, I'm, I'm very glad that I was able to like follow you. And then I think, you know, I'm sure I haven't told you this, but I, the way you, you would like live tweet Golden State Warriors games, I was like, <laughs> this is a real person. Like, I feel like I could like trust you and like, you know, just relate to you just on a very basic level, right? <laughs> like, yeah. suddenly, suddenly, like, it's not so scary to just uh, maybe initiate a conversation. Totally. Um, Twitter's just magic. I know. And I, I feel the same way. I mean, I feel like, you know, I think that there is this, you, you, I, as you know, you'll see this sort of divide on Twitter of people who are sort of like, mm, I'm only, I, I try to stick to the science, but you know, whatever. And, you know, and I just, I don't know, like we're whole people, right? Like all of us are whole yeah. people, whether or not we decide to show that aspect of it. And I know there's a wide range of views on how much of that you should share. I have this more uh, permissive on that front, but, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, I mean, I do think that these are things that, um, yeah, it, it, we can, it, it, you know, that's the nice thing too, it's up to everyone how they want to, you know, present themselves on that platform and others. Um, but yeah, I do, I do find that to me, um, yeah, like just, I have learned so much and I have, you know, been so inspired by people that, you know, it's like, even if they were or weren't, weren't willing to share, you know, but they are just out there shouting into the void and we are in a space where we can like have access to that. I think that's amazing. Like, it's just, it's just so cool that we can like benefit from the insights of like a, a, a broader range of people. Um, and it's really only limited by, you know, where, how wide we cast our net, right? And so I love having the power to do that, right? Just by deciding that we want to, you know, you know, follow more people and like we can say, and I think this, this also applies to your audience. Like if you're trying to get into a different career, you know, I just, I didn't, can't believe, I, I can't, like still fathom completely how siloed my life was. And like the moment I set one toe outside of that like academic context, like I instantaneously like was exposed to a universe of people. I started following to totally different people. People ask me all the time, like, oh, how do you get in? How do you get your foot in the door and mow all these people? I'm like, I, it's just literally the same way you do anything else. Like, it's just, it's just, oh, wait, you just start following new people and then you see who they follow and then you follow those people. And then you like learn something just the same way you sort of like crawl around and like find new connections and new people and start interacting. And it's the same thing. It's just like, you don't realize how narrow you are when everybody you know knows everybody you know, and they're all in this bucket. And now when you start to explore a little bit outside that, and then you start paying attention and you start, and they retweet things and they find, they, you know, things that they find insightful and you start following those people and start interacting with, you know, it's, it's like, yeah, you, you already know how to meet people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's Absolutely. just different people. <laughs> I, I, I feel like, you know, from my own end, it's a very basic process. Like I will follow someone if I like what they tweet. I like it. After a while, I might feel comfortable to like reply to their tweet. Yeah, it's awesome. And yeah, it, like something short and sweet, right? No, and in fact, like most of the time, like that's how I follow people back is if they reply to a tweet. So mm -hmm. like a lot of people are not doing that, but if they reply to a tweet, I'm always just like, oh yeah. And then I will like click on them and follow them. But like, I just, I wouldn't have known otherwise because I don't get an alert every time someone likes something or whatever. But if they reply, <laughs> you know, like then I have like some opportunity to like learn who people are. So yeah. And so I totally get people have different levels of comfort of like engaging with 
with people, but that's, you know, that's, that's how, you know, you know, people connect with others by yeah. trying. It, absolutely. I find that like, you know, what attracts me on Twitter is people sharing a, an original idea or a feeling basically tweeting something like relatable where I can say like, yes, I can see how this person from their brain generated this and put it out there. I know that it's very scary for people to do this. And I think I avoided it for years because like, <laughs> I didn't trust that people would be nice. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally get it. And then, you know, to be fair, people are not always nice, but but right. but it's also like, you know, and, and I think that there's, you know, real like harassment and problems and things on that, but there's yeah. nice tools to be able to just like walk and meet people. And so like, I, I do think that it can be sort of what we want it to be. And um, we can sort of curate that to our, our liking in many ways. And so I think that that, it just, I just find it to be like a truly powerful thing. It's completely changed my life for the better, I would say, um, just by opening my worldview <laughs> to more things. And I think that's awesome. For sure. I, I absolutely love this point. I mean, I, I'm a huge proponent of Twitter. Um, I hope that we can like maintain that magic, you know, the environment that we have. Obviously, Twitter may go through some changes and uh, yeah, the world is going through some changes, of course. Mm -hmm. So there are challenges ahead, but Yes. Um, I want to be respectful of your time here, um, but, you know, I've, there are certainly more things that would be interesting to, to chat about. Um, do you need to go at noon? Just a touch base. I actually do. I have a meeting at noon. Yes. Okay. Then I think we should bring it to our, our closing point here then, uh, so that you're able to get the final word here. Um, personally, I just want to thank you so much for coming aboard so quickly and sharing so many awesome, amazing insights with us. Um, yeah, Arkila, would you like to, to say anything? Yeah, thank you so much, Prachi, for all your insights, especially about keeping an open mind, going outside your comfort zone. I think that that will definitely help a lot of our listeners. And it's inspirational to have someone like you, you know, trying to revolutionize science. It's not something that someone actively pursues. It's something that's always in the back of our minds. So thank you for taking that initiative. That's, that would be... <laughs> what I would want to say. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. I really appreciate you having me on. And I, um, yeah, and so I wish you both the best of luck and um, and I'll uh, see you in the Twitterverse. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. And uh, perhaps we can do a follow-up conversation sometime in the future. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. I will go ahead and wrap up the recording here. Great.